officially uh, shake your hand, if I can help. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have Mike Erickson and Andrea Salinas um, talking with us about the race for Congressional District 6. Um, how about if we start with Andrea, um, you are the current uh, U.S. Representative uh, for the district. If you can start off by talking a little bit about why you think voters should send you back to Washington, D.C. Yeah, well, um, again, it's good to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm the proud daughter of an immigrant who came over from Me Mexico, and I work, grew up in a hardworking union family. And I know that change is possible in a single generation, but we all have to work for it. And I know because it happened for me and my family and my parents always taught me and my sister that value of hard work, that if we worked hard, anything was possible. So it's what I did. Our family didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up and I worked long hours at a bunch of different jobs to pay my way through school. And it took me a while, it took me seven years, but I'm proud to say that I finished my degree and became the first person in my family to graduate from college without any student debt. And I know that is so rare to happen today. And that experience got me thinking, how could it be this hard? I played by the rules. I did everything right. And I thought that hard work was supposed to be enough. And for every person who's asked themselves that question, I really feel that frustration. I know that working families like mine feel it every single day, that pain of falling, following all the rules, yet still falling short. And that's why I'm running. I know that families are suffering right now, and I'm running to bring down the cost of living and make life better for working people. I'm running because my daughter, Amelia, and her generation deserve better, cleaner air, water, fighting climate change. And I'm committed to delivering that better future for all Oregonians, no matter one's race, faith, ethnicity, zip code, gender identity, or sexual orientation. And I first served as an advocate, later as a state legislator. I fought to bring down the cost of prescription drugs, protect our environment for the future, and pass one of the strongest reproductive freedom laws in the country at the state level. I'm now bringing those same values and that same work ethic with me to Washington, D.C. And I really made it my mission to be a policymaker and not a politician. And it's why I'm working and trying to work with both parties to make sure we do just that. Tackle fentanyl and the addiction crisis. Make housing more affordable for Oregon families. I've secured over $315 million in different federal grant fundings from different agencies for programs and initiatives in my district, as well as me personally trying to reach out and um, get projects from different community members. So I was able to secure another $14 million in direct funding that I fought for and successfully delivered things around infrastructure, public safety and housing. And then for next year, I requested 23 more million for projects right here at home. So I've been fighting. I've been delivering for this community over the past two years, almost two years. Um, as a member of Congress and five years before that as a state legislator, I want to continue to do the work needed to make it e Oregon a better place for everyone to live. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excuse me. Mike, if you can start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and why voters should vote for you. Sure. I'm a small business owner here in Tigard. I started a company 30 years ago after being in college at Portland State University. Uh, maybe like Andrea a little bit. Um, I started this um my, I've been in Oregon for almost 45 years, whatever it's been, went to college here, worked at Tiger Fred Meyer, and literally um, worked my way through college by working at Fred Meyer in another job. Uh, after school, I'd go work at the Tiger Fred Meyer at nights from, from 6 o'clock till 1030. Did that, worked 32 hours a week, and um, got my, as the first person in my family to get a degree, got my business degree from Portland State, and I too didn't take out student loans and things like that. I was lucky to... Um, um, my dad was a policeman for 30 years. And when I asked him, hey, dad, I'd like to go to college. And can you help me? He said, son, I make about $30,000 a year. I'm a policeman. Um, my mom was a homemaker. Um, so literally, my dad said to me, if you want to go to college, you need to sit out between high school and college. So I literally did. I had worked at Fred Meyer, two of the jobs. And I saved money for a year between high school and college to the point where I could start paying for my own education. As a police officer, my dad, like I said, made enough money that you didn't qualify for Pell Grants and other loan assistance. So unfortunately, I couldn't get a Pell Grant. I couldn't get some other things. So I know how tough that is when you're trying to get through school. So I earned it. And I'm really proud that I'm the first person in my family to get a degree as well. And the fact that I did it on my own, paid for it by working my way through school without any debts, without borrowing money from the, the government. I'm proud of my education, what it means to me, because I really worked my tail off to get that degree. I got my business degree in college. I was student body president uh, when I was there. Played football at Portland State. 
Um, we were on the Pokey Islands national championship teams. I went to the national championship and I was a all league kicker and punter. So I've been well rounded when it comes to politics and college and things and 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 other stuff. So I've been real busy as a young person. Once I started my company here, I realized how important it is to make sure your employees have health care, benefits, um, insurance. They've got all the retirement plans. So I set up a really good health care 401k plan for my employees. And I know what it's like to run a business. There are struggles and it's tough, um, especially when you're a startup. Uh, I started the company out of my, my house, literally in the basement of my garage, both to try to run this business. Um, within five, 10 years, our company became one of the fastest growing companies in Oregon. I started hiring more and more people, uh, ranked by the Portland Business Journal, Inc. 500, um, listed us three times as one of the fastest growing companies in America. And it wasn't because somebody gave it to me. It's because when I started this company, it was just me. I'm the founder and the sole owner of the company, the CEO and president today, actively. Uh, I'm real busy growing the company. We've expanded into Europe now. We've expanded to Toronto and New York and Boston. Our headquarters is still right here in Tigard, and we've been growing the company. And I'm really proud of the fact that I give back as well. I give back to I'm one of the top corporate philanthropists um, ranked by the Portland Business Journal for the things I do with the Maurice Lucas Foundation and other organizations like SEI so, and other groups. I've been a part of the Kiwanis Club. I was a program chair for years here in Tigard. So I spent a lot of time trying to give back to the community. I've been blessed to have a good company that I started, and we're still growing. We've had a real good year the last couple of years, and I'm, I'm blessed to have a good team. People have been with me 15, 20 years, and you know, you treat your employees well, they work hard for you. And I really believe in giving back to the community and helping others. I want to bring that hardworking value to Congress and bring a small business perspective to other people back in D.C. that really aren't business owners. They don't know what it's like to struggle when, when COVID hit. The main source of our income at my company, AFMS, was going to trade shows and marketing, but they shut down all the trade shows, all the um, conferences across the country for two years. So my sales team had a big dip when it came to, um, and I know what it's like to struggle. So you had to think creatively and start doing webinars online and things like that. So we bounced back and we're having some really good years again. But as a business owner, you're always a problem solver, whether it be trying to keep lower healthcare costs for your employees or making sure your employees and your company are helping other companies. We're a supply chain logistics company, so we help some of the biggest companies in the United States, like John Deere and Starbucks and Under Armour. we got big companies that we help them with their strategy, cost reduction initiatives, and other things to move their freight all over the world. And we'll talk a little more about that, how that could help reduce inflation in my background. But I, I really feel that we need someone with that kind of background, that kind of experience in Washington, D.C., now more than ever, that can bring a, a business perspective to the problems we're seeing across this country. Great. But Thank you, the Brian. last thing I want to say on that is I do have a young family, nine-year-old, 12-year-old, you know, they're going to school. I'm, I'm seeing this country's future is a lot different than it was five, 10 years ago. We're no longer the United States of America. We're the divided States of America. And we've become so polarizing about our political views. It's time we work together. I had a mom who was more of a Democrat. My dad's a Republican. My wife's a Republican. Her identical twin is a Democrat. Um, my, like I said, my dad's a policeman. My, one, my wife's been a a labor livery nurse for Good Sam for many years. She's a nurse now. So we come from a household that's both R's and D's, and we get along. We can work across party lines. We, we, we talk about political issues at dinner and things like that. And there's no fighting like you see what's going on in Washington, D.C. I think that's wrong. We need someone in Congress who can actually go back there and be able to work across party lines to solve this country's problems. And I think I'll do a good job at that. But um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mike, if you can go first on this question, um, what would be your top two priorities if you were elected? Um, right now, everything I hear, whether it be working at the state fair or county fairs or meeting people on the streets over and over, the people in the district, are they're telling me that $150 towards everyday kitchen table items like your your food and your, your groceries and your milk and your other stuff, maybe not milk, but your eggs and other things, basic staples, you could spend $150 a few years ago. It's now $300 for the exact same items. Someone just came up to me at some event and says, here's a receipt from two years ago. The exact same items. I went back to Safeway and bought the exact same items, brought that receipt, everything exactly the same. It was $400 today. It was $150 two years ago. That's it. That's got to stop. People are very, very, up and, and they're not doing well economically, they're they're hurting, they're about to lose their households or their rent, can't pay the rents. 
And on top of that, electricity bills, which are the, a staple of you being in a home to keep warm and cook your food, are up 30% in the last two years. I mean, the, the electricity um, bills are just outrageous. Rent is skyrocketing, whether it be rent, um, rents for an apartment or trying to buy a home, interest rates. I want to do everything I can to get those things under control, get interest rates lower, push the Federal Reserve to do the best job they can to get interest rates back to the 4 or 5% level. I think we need to do everything we can to get inflation under control. And I got some ideas later that when you ask some details, I'll give you some really good details that no one's really talking about from a business perspective on how you can have a big impact immediately on getting all those things lower, all those things that are on your shelves at Fred Meyer or Safeway, things that people aren't really talking about. But those are some of my priorities besides securing the border. I think what's going on there and all the, the crime and all the stuff that comes with 10 to 15 million, dollar, million people coming across the border under the under a disguise of being, you know, it's not here for they're here for jobs, but they're saying they're here for other reasons. That's just wrong. Great. Thank you. Um, Andrew, how about you? What would be your top two priorities for if you're elected to a second term? Yeah, thank you. I think um, Mike set up the challenge very nicely. I do hear all the time from constituents that they're having a tough time making ends meet. And I call um, the issues, and I'm seeing it in my household, the G&H issues, right? Gas, groceries, housing, and healthcare. And right now, I have been working really hard to pass a bipartisan farm bill. I serve on the farm bill, um, or excuse me, the agriculture committee in the house. And I've been trying to pass a farm bill that will stabilize our food supply chain, make sure that it support, supports our local farmers, but also that it gives some relief to people who are going to the grocery store. We need to bring down the cost of groceries. I, in fact, today I just signed a letter. I led on it. I asked all of my colleagues on the house ag committee to encourage our leadership to make sure that we pass something this year. Our farmers across the United States need those price supports, those commodity supports right now. We need to address um, crop insurance for our small and specialty crops that don't have it right now in Oregon. And so those are some of the things. Wildfires, I'm actually the ranking member on the um, forestry subcommittee. I got a provision on um, wildland firefighting in that bill. But it only made it out of the committee. We need to pass it. And so we need to come, we need to work with the Senate um, when we get back after the election. So that's G. Um, one of the other issues is housing, of course. And so I have actually supported legislation to build more affordable housing and make sure we stop hedge funds from buying up entire neighborhoods. We know that they are able to come in, they buy up these neighborhoods, and then they have a monopoly over the community and they're able to dictate prices. So um, I've also um, co-sponsored some additional housing bills, um, the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, that would actually expand the low-income housing tax credit and support the financing of nearly 2 million new affordable homes nationwide. We know that Oregon is not the only state, but in Oregon, 140,000 units short, supply is a huge is issue. We also need to get more private activity bonds into the marketplace to support people who, um, private investors who maybe want to do it, but they don't want to take on all the risk. Gas and utilities, also a huge issue. I'm seeing it again in my house, in my household. I help, you know, I help to do the budget. My husband and I do it together. Um, so I voted to prohibit selling our strategic oil reserves to China. That should, and that should help, you know, stabilize costs at the pump. We have seen um, gas prices um, go down, but we need upgrades to our energy infrastructure. We have seen devastation after devastation with all of the climate events that have happened with our utility and power supply lines. So that is costing us all more. We need to get our arms around climate. That's the bigger issue here. And then finally, healthcare. We need to make sure that people have access to healthcare and that the prescription and access means being able to afford it as well. So I'm a co-sponsor of a bill called Lowering Drug Costs for American Families Act. Um, I've been very supportive of the ability for Medicare to negotiate drug prices under the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, we need to pass that on into private sector as well. And I've been pushing up against um, pharmaceutical benefit managers, kind of the go-between to supposedly reduce prescription drug prices. Um, but we're really pushing on them to make sure that that middleman doesn't end up taking all the profits. But also, I want to make sure we have all women have access to reproductive health. This is also a financial issue. We need to make sure that women are able to decide whether, when, and how to get pregnant. And that freedom to decide that should only be based on the woman. And right now we are seeing and hearing, you know, post 
um, the post Dobbs decision, all of these states making disparate decisions about women's health care, we're feeling the effects of that right here in Oregon. You know, we know that Idaho has basically banned abortion. We are seeing patients coming across state lines. Providers are very afraid of whether or not they are going to be held legally liable liable for providing abortions from these different states. That has an impact. So we have more patients here now that are seeking care and we are seeing fewer providers. I want to make sure, I think, um, that actually we have, we go back to a pro Roe v. Wade state across the nation so that every woman has that freedom to decide whether, when, and how to get pregnant. Um, let's actually jump into that. Um, and Andrea, if you could go first on this question, um, should the right to an abortion be federally legislated? And if so, are there any limits that you would put on it? I do think it should be um, legislated at the federal level to allow women to make that decision on their own. And people want the freedom to decide for themselves, as I mentioned, if, when, and how to start a family. Um, they want access to contraception. When I was um, an advocate back in 2017, I helped to pass the, at the time, it was the most comprehensive reproductive health bill in the nation. It, it included everything, right? Because women also want safe pregnancies. So it included everything from preconception care, prenatal care, safe labor and delivery, postpartum care, and yes, abortion care as well. It even included vasectomies for men who chose to seek those, right? So we it was an equitable bill, but you cannot put restrictions or limits or sideboards only a woman, there are so many different permutations, only women, only people with a uterus can understand all of the permutations that go into getting pregnant, preventing pregnancies, having safe labor and deliveries. If you have never had the ability to do that, I don't want some politician in my exam room telling me how, when to get pregnant or or if I need care that is life-saving. And we have heard so many examples around the nation that are really putting women's lives at risk. That is unacceptable. And this has to be a nationwide, we need to go back to the days of where Roe v. Wade was legal. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, would you then leave it up to states for the last trimester in terms of, of um, whether there's a limit or not? Or would the federal legislation that you support be without any kind of, uh, that it would just be guaranteed across states for with without a, a limit? We should allow women and their providers to know what the right medical um, terms are for that pregnancy. Great, thank you. Um, um, so that would go beyond Roe. In in that it would, you wouldn't leave it up to states after a certain time period to determine if there should be additional limits. That's right. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Mike, same question for you. Would you support a um, federally legislating the right to an abortion? I, I believe in what's been done here in Oregon. The Constitution has been restructured to allow a woman to get an abortion at any point or um, I think that after about 15 weeks or 13 weeks it becomes a little um, my point of view is wrong I think Andrea Salinas would feel like even at month eight or month ninth a month the ninth month or eight month she would allow or want, give people the right to have an abortion all the way up to ninth month of pregnancy I haven't heard her say no but uh, from everything I'm hearing from her on her radio and TV commercials she's the most outspoken person for abortion rights, which means to me, all the way up to the ninth month, she would allow people to get an abortion almost to the point where it's born. And I'd like to hear her answer on that, but I, I believe the state's decisions are should be respected. And I'm not going to Congress to ask for a national um, amendment to change it and make abortion um, denied for everybody nationwide. I will not do that. I'm going to respect yeah, and honor yeah, what's sure. happened here in Oregon and respect that. I'm not going to Congress to vote on this issue, and we won't in Oregon. And so, but I, I still like to know what the answer is if you would allow abortion at month nine. In, infanticide is illegal. It is illegal. Uh, uh, ninth month, well, the bit, well, it's still, my wife's a labor delivery nurse, high risk. I deal with all the health care. May I answer, issues. Mike? Yeah, May I answer? Just, infanticide is 
illegal. So if it is viable, it is illegal. I would say that if the life of the mother is at risk, she and her provider can make that decision. And I know having almost two miscarriages, how devastating those decisions are at the time. I would never, and I wanted both pregnancies and I only had one, I would never want a politician walking into the exam room, even if it was just metaphorically to tell me and my spouse and my provider what to do at that time. If it meant the life of the fetus, if it meant my life, those are very personal decisions. And we do not want politicians making those calls. Well, that's not my question to you. I think you sort of circumvented it. Uh, having a, a, a wife who's been labor livery, a good Sam, for many, many years, there are points where what you're saying, your abortion rights, is that a woman with no mother's life in danger, no risk for the fetus. If a woman wants like to. Like, how often does that happen? Uh, at month nine, I would like to hear your answer. At month nine, but, you but, agree uh, that a woman should get an abortion with none of the other issues. Mike, what is how often uh, does that happen? Can I get your answer? No, <laughs> I, I do okay, actually want to. I, I want to. I would like to hear. Do you do you have any data in terms of how often that happens? I mean, no. is this just sort of right? Because actually, the data shows that less than one percent of abortions happen. I believe after week twenty. So I mean, yeah, I, I just want to know what the rules are because at any point is what I hear her saying in all her commercials are that a woman's right to get an abortion should be at any point in her pregnancy. That means all the way up to month seven, eight, or nine. And I just think that's wrong. Coming from a, a with a wife that does labor livery a lot in her past. Uh, you, Mike, you're talking uh, a lot about your wife. Life. When was the last time you were pregnant? Uh, we went through three miscarriages ourselves. I understand that. How devastating it is when you're carrying for three months, you have a miscarriage. I, I'm sorry that it happened to you, Salinas, but that, Ms. Salinas, but that happened to me as well. So we went through all that. Um, that's that's wrong. We struggled. That we're lucky to have two kids. I know you're blessed to have one. We would like to have four, but it didn't work for us. And so I understand all those issues, especially like IVF and things like that, where families are trying to have kids. And I, I support IVF, by the way. And so I hope I don't hear any of your commercials that say I want to take those rights away from you. Well, here's a question. And so I, the last thing I'll also you... say on record is I do believe in a, in a mother's life, incest, and rape. Those should be up to you as a woman. I've never said anything about that, but you put on TV that I would take in you know, those three instances. I disagree with that. I never have said that. I totally think a woman should be able to have an um, abortion if the mother's life's in danger, rape, or incest. I want to be okay. on the record here so I don't see us on a commercial here next week. I, I do want to kind of go back to the, the question, make sure I understand what your answer is. You would not support federal legislation either either banning or establishing a, a right to abortion? Correct. Okay, no, so to, 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 to prevent that, you know, like a national abortion, you know, saying you can't do that nationally. OK, so you would not support even though even though there is a big push um, among some Republicans to to have. That's not me. OK, so you would you would uh, defy the caucus on that if that okay. was something that they were pushing for. OK, great. Even though you supported you were anti-choice. In no, I, I think up to a certain point where the baby's heart starts beating and other things is where I draw the line. Uh, except for the mother's life in danger, rape and incest. I think there's a point in time where there's a happy medium here. I'm pro-life and I would like to I would love to have two more kids. Uh, we had two miscarriages. I wish I had three or four kids. We didn't get that done. Uh, so I'm concerned about those things also and IVF for people that can't have kids. And so that's where I stand on this issue. Okay, and and just because I'm, I was just a little confused by the the last part. Um, you were saying that that you would oppose it, it once there's a heartbeat. So, are, would you oppose a federal ban on abortions um, if it came after, for instance, the sixth week or the eighth week? I'm not sure what week is the right week. I don't think there's really a right answer, but I think the heartbeat of a baby starts around week what. 10, six. six. That's the point. Yeah. It's like, so that may be your point. My, I'm answering the question, but that's where I, I would probably draw the line for sure. Okay. So, once so once you're a living organ, a baby, you're a living um, human being, I, I think it's terrible to do that. 
Okay. And and I, I apologize, I keep kind of honing in on this, but I, I am kind of confused now in terms of what your stance is. You were saying before that you would not support a ban on abortion, but it and does... That's I think the Roe v. Wade and what's happened with the state rights is where I feel it's best. Let the states decide however they vote. So Oregon here has passed its a constitutional amendment. State voted for it, that they would allow women to have an abortion. And I'm not here to change that. And I support what the Oregon voters have done and voted for and I, I'm, I'm going to Congress not to change that, but to help fix the inflation, fix the economy, fix the border. Those are things I'm going. This is not an issue that's going to be um, changed here in Oregon. And I'm right. not going to try to change that. But but the problem is that if it is a, it might not be a priority for you. It is a priority for other people within Congress, for other Republicans. And, you know, as a member of Congress, that is something that could be you know, that that you could be asked to vote on. And so and I, I know, guess I think I answered that question. No, actually, I'm I'm sorry, I'm confused because it does you sound I would like not vote against that. You said you'd go against your uh, certain Republican right. members. That's you're correct. But, it's like they answered twice now. But yes, except you kind of changed that when we were asking about the um about the stage in terms of when there's a heartbeat that no, you would oppose. That's what me personally, I'm, I'm not okay. that's, that's I believe personally. Okay, but so if if there was something along those lines, you would regardless of what the limit is, you would not support a ban. Correct. Okay. okay. I believe in the state rights making their decisions on that issue. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the economy. Um, but, but I never did get, I know I got a little drill there, but I never get the answer from Andrea. If would at month eight, a normal um, pregnancy, no issues, would you, do you think it's right for a woman to get abortion at month eight or ninth, assuming there's no issues? So, For you me, know, I, me, myself, six weeks, I wanted it. What about month eight? Would you do it? Of course, I would still want it in month eight. Amelia oh. went 38 weeks. I wanted her. No, I asked, would you want an abortion? Uh, or uh, would you think women should be able to have abortion at month eight or nine? No issues. Mike, of course not. That's not what we're talking well, that's about. That's what you're. That's how. But that's. But, you but here's on your commercial. okay. So this is actually kind of going in a direction I that is really not helpful. Um, I would kind of point out just if if something is legal, you don't change it for various. You know. I just want to know where she stood on that for for rights. I mean, no. Really. I don't think. Okay. I, let's let's move on. Um, so both presidential and. Um, I guess, Mike, if you can go first on this um, and hold on just a second, I have to let Laura in. There we go. Um, Mike, both presidential candidates are proposing various ideas for cutting taxes, imposing tariffs, not taxing tipped income and other pretty populist sounding policies. Which ones do you agree with and why? Or do you agree with any of them? Uh, I'm a, as a small business owner, I've been a free market guy when it comes to you know, all this stuff with taxes and issues I've always been that way. I think the market can affect, um, like when I saw Kamala Harris say that she wants to put price controls on certain food items, that's not going to really solve the problem. Or putting large, extra large tariffs on certain items is not going to so solve the problem. I think free trade is where you, you create good products and there's demand, and, and the, the market controls the price out there is where I believe in. Um, I, I work with a lot of transportation companies and other um, big companies that are manufacturers that are importing and exporting. And we deal with all the tariffs and the issues that are coming in here. Um, people are, you know, they're doing it for certain reasons. They want American made products here, discourage foreign imports. They do it for many different reasons. They do it for whatever it may be for um, tax reasons as well. Um, I personally think that we should, um, we don't need to be raising taxes, first of all, on, on the middle class and other people. I would never vote for something like that. I think we can just have a, a free market that can grow again when you get lower interest rates out there. You get lower interest rates out there, you're going to see this economy boom. And you're going to see a lot more revenue and income coming in from all different sources across America that will help add to reducing our national debt. The national debt is, what, $34, $35 trillion right now? And we got to cut spending as much as we can and be frugal with the American taxpayer dollars. And so I think growing the economy and not taxing people. We don't have a, a a tax problem. We have a spending problem. I think we need to do more to control spending. I'm a fiscal conservative, a, a business here in my life and in general. I would do everything I can to make sure we spend our taxpayer dollars wisely back there and let the economy grow and help cut down and reduce our inflation 
and under national debt. Um, I, I believe that's the best way to approach it. Okay. Um, and just uh, to follow up on that a little bit, if Trump is elected and he is looking to impose um, tariffs, is that something that you would you would object to? And that, well, and you have to look at each one separately. There may be something on like American steel versus Chinese made steel. And I'm not sure what some of the reasons are for some of those, but the Biden-Harris administration has kept a lot of those tariffs in place for some reason. And obviously I'm not back looking at all the details, but I would look at those. Um, I would try to educate my positions on each one of those, those tariffs. If I had to vote them on individually, usually they're not. Usually they come in as a bill and you got a whole bunch of issues on there. I'd research them all before I vote yes or no on every one of them and what the impact is to the, both the Americans, uh, manufacturers and people buying those products and how it affects our, our partners abroad, whether it be timber coming in from Canada or other things from Mexico. You look at all that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and in terms of tipped income, um, uh, you would, would would you keep the current tax structure? Would you exempt it from from? Taxes? I think that's a good idea. I mean, after both Trump came out with it and then um, Kamala Harris said she agreed with that too. Looking at that, the, some of the people, those people that are struggling the most, they really need a little extra help. We all, I mean, when you're younger and you're starting a family, you're you're maybe working as a uh, part-time job as a waitress or waiter, you're doing all that. And I mean, you're barely making ends meet today. I mean, to be taxing some of these folks and they they don't get paid very well, by the way. Um, they're the small, some of these small restaurants are barely surviving. You know, you can't really raise your prices on your your menu items because people won't go there. So you got a happy medium. I've talked to a lot of restaurant owners that are concerned about rising costs for labor, rising food costs. Your rents are going up to run your restaurants if you got a lease. All those are big impacts. That's why you're seeing more and more restaurants going out of business because the, you got to really make sure you're, you're taking care of your workers so they can work. They, they, they cut their hours now. You go to a restaurant now, they're not open on mornings because they don't have the staffing. So I think if you go through and don't tax the, the, the staff that works at the restaurants, that'll provide more people to come back to that area part of the workforce, which I think is a good thing. Um. Andrea, same question for you. Both presidential candidates are proposing ideas for cutting taxes, imposing tariffs, um, exempting tipped income from taxes. Uh, what what ideas do you agree with and why, if any? So we are going to see a big um, tax bill next year, no matter who's in charge. Um, many of the Trump tax cuts that he gave to those individuals making over $400,000 and corporations, and I'm assuming, Mike, you probably got some of those big tax breaks given um, your business interests. Um, yeah, they all got a huge tax break, and that added tremendously to the U.S. deficit. And so a lot of them will be expiring um, next year, and some of them already have, which is why I voted Um with it was a bipartisan bill. I think um, Republicans and Democrats recognized that the child tax credit was a great way to reduce childhood poverty. That is something that we need to make sure that we extend um, over the next, you know, five years so, or however long this next tax package is going to be. I think there are other ways that we need to make sure that families are not just surviving but thriving. And we know that childcare is another big one. Um, I would like to, us to rethink what our revenue streams look like from those who do make over $400,000 and those large corporations. We've seen a lot of, um, I think, a lot of um, record profits over the last few years from some of these companies. And it's time that they we even it out, especially for our middle class families who are really struggling to get by. So the child tax credit would be one thing that I would make sure that we um, implement longer term. Some of the housing tax credits that I talked about to make sure that we spur additional development in the housing markets, whether it's um, low income housing, uh, middle income housing, the whole spectrum. We need it all right now. Um, and then making sure that folks have um, the ability to pay for child care. I think those are three really important things. Um, we have heard, I've heard from economists directly that, you know, tariffs really do come back on consumers. We know that a lot of things that we may have national companies like Nike and Columbia that are based here in the United States or in Oregon, but they manufacture overseas. And if they're manufacturing in China and then you go to buy your, you know, your kids' school sneakers or their Columbia sportswear clothes, you're getting those tariffs put back on you. So that is a tax on American consumers. We do need to rethink that. And I think that will be part of a tax and trade package next year as well. So I think these are some big items. Um, in terms of the tip income, 
Um, you know, I think that's probably where Mike and I agree. I think a lot of um, folks who work in the restaurant and service industries are middle income Americans. And I think they are struggling. And, you you know, I've heard from people out um, in the, you know, the Portland metro area, but, you know, obviously Marion County, all over Oregon, it's really expensive to live. And so to have to live and work near, you know, um, near your place of work um, gets very expensive. And when you're a tipped worker, sometimes, you know, being taxed on that, it could help to, you know, to put you in a living wage to not be taxed on that. So I would consider that I would probably also be mindful of our ballooning deficit. So I wouldn't want to, you know, put too many sweet things into that mix, but to make sure that middle income families are not just getting by, but really thriving. I guess I'm wondering, and and Andrea, if you can um, go first on this, um, it's interesting that you both kind of do support this idea of exempting tax tipped income. Um, why? I mean, is that financially responsible in your viewpoint? I mean, you you mentioned the the ballooning deficit, but also as opposed to doing something more targeted that looks at people across the board, re regardless of industry, who are at a lower income level. Why that's should kind, people? Yeah. Okay. No, and that's kind of what I was getting at. So you know, so people because you can also be at a very high end restaurant, and you know, my daughter um, over the summer worked at Jersey Mike's, and she was topping out with her tips at like between seventeen and twenty dollars an hour, right? And for her to you know, save up money to go to college. That's, you know, that's what she was doing. But people at higher end restaurants, even though the restaurant may be running on a margin, a lot of times the, you know, the wait staff may not be. So, so I kind of do agree with you, Helen, like, yes, you can take it by industry or you can take a broad sweeping approach. And I think Congress, um, if they do it correctly, will take a broad sweeping approach and look at the different um, tax margins. Okay. Um, and Mike, anything more that you want to add on that that front in terms of the financial, um, you know, repercussions of of uh, exempting just tipped income versus looking at something broader across a, a lower well, income? Yeah, from a, a business perspective, I mean, it, I know Andrea's never run a business. I'm not saying that negatively, but you never have. You've been a politician in your life, but I've been running a business for 30 years. I've got three different businesses I run now, um, not just my logistics supply chain. I've got several other businesses I own and operate here. In Oregon as well, and I, I see these small uh, business restaurants, and I, you know, they're struggling. The owners of these restaurants who save up all their money, they work long hours, and the owners tell me, "Hey, this would be a good thing for their employees as well. It gives them a reason to keep sticking around and working." I mean, these, but it's not just them nowadays. You go to any restaurant, like a, you know, any of the, the fast food restaurants, everyone's hit the button on your on your credit card tip for you. You know, you know, all you do is pick up a Starbucks. You want to tip? Yes. I mean, these folks are struggling and there's a lot of those folks out there. I think those are some of the folks that really need the most help right now, especially with what's going on with the economy, the cost of goods, inflation. That, that's right now, at least in my mind, that's where it should be. It should be removed. Okay. Um, since we already hit abortion, let's hit another hot button uh, topic. Um, and Mike, if you could go first on this. Uh, what action on gun safety would you support? For instance, any kind of national safe storage laws or minimum age for uh, semi-automatic weapon purchases, regulation of ghost guns. Um, is there anything that you would look to pass on a national level? Yeah, I, I support the Second Amendment, but I also support responsible gun ownership. Having a father as a police officer, we had gun safes. We'd go to the shooting range and shoot clay pigeons and do things together. My dad taught me what's right and wrong with holding a gun and gun safety. I think all the gun safety courses are important, more important than you realize. But also one of the biggest things is the um, the folks that should not have a gun. There are a lot of folks that you see all these shootings and school shootings and other things. There's a lot of mental health issues associated with each of those. And we need to do more to make sure people that have some mental health issues should never have a gun and have the opportunity to do something like we're seeing in these schools and other things. I'm, I'm all about making sure the, the, the gun safety checks are done, make sure that your, your background checks are done, and whatever we can do to make um, help, help owning a gun safer for the community and for the own gun owners and the children that live in homes. You see just recently, some of the parents had their kids have guns. And I mean, that's irresponsible gun ownership. And I, I would do everything I can to make sure those laws are enforced so we really make sure that people do have guns and those trying to get guns of all the right background checks. So is there, um, 
I guess, is there anything new the, that you would support or, for instance, red flag, uh, national red flag law of some sort um, or, um, you know, Yeah, if there are some red flags where somebody's posting things, that's what I meant about some mental health. But if you see some things where someone's posting some things online and, you know, even commenting about doing something crazy, like killing a teacher or doing something like that, 100% those red flag things should be alerted to the um, to law enforcement and to the right people and the families so that we can prevent what could be a, a, a bad situation, 100%. So would you support something like what Oregon has where you can actually, uh, there is a, a confiscation of a weapon from a home if there is one of these, if there's something that, that qualifies as a red flag? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. I'm a responsible gun owner myself, and I and I, I teach my kids when they have a BB gun, point it down, and it's gun safety, and uh, wearing your goggles, and all that stuff. I have a little nine-year-old, ten-year-old, twelve-year-old that um, you know that want to be able to shoot at a target and things like that. I'm teaching them gun safety at a very young age when it comes to even a, a Daisy BB gun that you used to see on TV, where you used to say, "You know, shoot your eye out." I told my you know, watch that show and. you know, the little Christmas carol, but, you know, I preach that a lot to my kids and you can hurt yourself even with a BB gun. You can ricochet off a rock and hit you in the eye. And so I believe in that. And so. Thank you. Um, Andrea, how about you? Are there any um, specific bills or things that you would be supportive of? Absolutely. Um, and like Mike, I, you know, I think we can have, I know we can, I, you know, support the Second Amendment. I know that we can support the rights of gun owners, and I know that we can keep our children safe. And given that um, guns are the leading cause of deaths for kids under 18 years old, um, I think we have to do it. It's incumbent upon us. And I think, you know, the more mass shootings we have across the United States, the more fearful these young families are of being able to protect their kids. So I hear both. And as, you know, someone who also grew up with a father in law enforcement, he, you know, worked in the police farmer for 32 years, I was always around guns myself. And so I understand the importance of this. I also know that Oregon has passed. Um, I think, you know, I will say with my leadership, some good, um, some good laws around safe storage. Um, I think we can take the model from Oregon and apply it nationwide. I think red flag laws, universal background checks are really important. Those are two different bills that I have signed on to um, and would be happy to work with my colleagues across the aisle to, to get something done, because I know they're hearing from their constituents as well. I hear it all the time from my colleagues that, you know, it's just, it's hard though, right? When I know that they are being um, harassed by the, the National Rifle Association and the gun lobby. But I think people recognize that this is a public health issue. This is a bigger issue than any of us. And keeping kids safe is, is a real problem, you know? And I, frequently hear that there are mental health issues that are also being addressed. And again, it goes back to we can do both, right? We can keep firearms away from our children and keep them safe. And we can also keep people who should not have them um, from getting them. But that mental health piece is really important. And so, you know, I, I'm now the co-chair of the Mental Health Caucus. I have a number of different bills um, around this. But this cannot just be lip service. We actually have to get something done. And I'm really actually proud of a lot of the work that I've been doing in a bipartisan fashion to work across the aisle to see if we can do something on this. Great, thank you. Um, I also wanted to, to ask about um, immigration in terms of there was a bill that uh, Democrats and Republicans in the Senate have been working on that was killed um, at Trump's request. Um, and, but, it certainly went farther than Democrats had generally been willing to go in the past. Um, Andrea, is that something, is that a bill that you would have voted for? So I'm glad you asked me about that, Helen, um, because the night that we were actually getting a briefing um, from uh, Senator Murphy on the bill, I was with my Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And, and I will say, I, you know, just to preface all of this, as the daughter of a Mexican immigrant, I know the immigrant story and I know how much they contribute to the fabric of our communities. And I think we should be a welcoming nation. And I also think that we don't have orderly migration right now. We don't. And I went down to the border last May. I saw it. It's not sustainable. I talked with Customs and Border Patrol. What they are seeking is additional personnel, um, additional technology. And, um, and I've been trying to work with my, again, with my Republican colleagues to get something like that done. I will say you are absolutely right in that proposal. I didn't actually get to hear the entire um, description 
before we all saw Senator McConnell tweeting out that he had just told his colleagues to essentially vote down the bill and that it was dead on arrival. And so it is really hard when someone like me is trying, trying, trying to bring people together to say, like, I will have to swallow, you know, potentially what some people could see a poison pill, but I'm willing to negotiate on this, right? I know I'm not going to get everything on this. I would love to see, you know, a pathway to citizenship for our dreamers and people who've been living and working here for 40 years or their kids who, have, you know, who have been raised here, have gone to college and are trying to start lives here. I would, those pieces were not part of that bill and part of that negotiation, but I didn't even get through the whole description in my entire briefing before I was told it was dead because President Trump basically told the Republicans in Congress that he would rather use it as a political cudgel than actually make progress. That's not me. I was furious. And so I started actually um, talking about it, talking about how ridiculous that is, especially for those of us who are serious legislators. I am a serious legislator. I am not there for the political antics of Trump and his minions in Congress. And I have found some good people in the middle who I can work with, but clearly on this issue, they were all talk and no action. So with the absence well, yeah, of this- I guess, uh, which oh, House hold, hold bill are you referring to, Helen? There was oh, like this is, several this, that popped up. The Senate House, bill. HR it was a, two, uh, Salinas voted against. For, wait, so no, th so this, was, this was a compromise bill that um, uh, Republican and Democratic senators were working on that oh. failed in the Senate. And so it now, didn't- Let me ask on that bill, didn't it also have a bunch of stuff with um, Ukraine- and other things all built around that whole thing. It wasn't just one bill on the House. This, uh, that was, I think, I think you're thinking of a, an earlier- The one um, that people voted no on because it was laden with other things and not a standalone bill for the border. And I, I can, I looked at all that there. So, I mean, maybe there's been several popped up, but from what I'm hearing, the reason they turned that down was because of other things associated. I've heard that from a lot of sources. <laughs> The, there are there are a number of stories where Republican senators where where Mitch McConnell have confirmed it was that that President Trump had said that he wanted them to kill the bill. No, oh, so but, we did, I'm not a part of it. I'm just saying that bill right. had other things associated with it. It wasn't just a border bill. Well, OK, so actually, I do want to follow up with something with you, Andrea. So the the parts of the. Um, the portions that were the aspects that you really wanted to see in the bill that weren't. Um, would that have been enough to make you vote no if it had made it to the House? No, I was actually considering it. No, I, I, we need order, right? We, we definitely need order at the border. And, you know, so I have signed on to a number of different bills. Um, it's, I think it's called the Security Border or the Border Security Act, which actually would add additional um, customs and border personnel, as well as um, the technology. We got to see the the tr different trucks and vehicles moving through. And actually there was one x-ray machine that showed bricks inside the seat of a truck bed, essentially. So they were trying, they were smuggling something through that looked illicit. You know, you couldn't tell exactly what it was, but they just don't have enough personnel to keep up with the flow of migrants coming across. You know, there are also other things that we could be doing to make sure that the conditions upon which people are fleeing their homes, I always say you don't put, you know, a kid on your back and a kid on your hip and walk thousands of miles um, just, just for fun, right? There are definitely conditions on whether it's economic opportunity or um, fleeing um, drugs and harassment or um, climate conditions in your own home nation, there are definitely reasons. And we have to address those too, I think, in the nations where they are. But we have not made any changes since like 1990 to our actual uh, um, asylee and immigration system either, right? And we have now 5 billion more people. So when this happened, we had 3 billion people on the planet, we now have 8 billion people, and we still have the same immigration system from 1990. We now have a workforce, you know, our farming community relies on the workforce at our Southern border, right? So we have to make sure that whatever happens has our, my growers and those folks in mind as well. But yes, I was absolutely willing to look at it and to understand what pieces I could hopefully, you know, if it came over wholesale from the Senate, were there things in it that I could work with some of my Republican colleagues on the House side to get amended and that sort of thing. And that's, that is always the frame of mind that I go into any piece of legislation. Thank you. Um, so Mike, let me ask you, um, there is, uh, there was a story that- Same, moved... same question? 
I didn't get Actually, a chance to answer it. If you want to, I um, no, quickly, I do I, want I to ask you to kind of related, the, but. Well, I'm, it's about the border is your big question. I would have voted for that as well. I'm all about securing the border. I'm all about, and all the resources for the border patrol agents and the technology to make them do the job better, easier. But, but truth is the matter is she voted no to HR2 when it had a chance to do the same thing. She voted no on that. Um, so, uh, and she's a big proponent for more benefits for those that do come across the border illegally and get them to different communities. We're paying for people to come up to different states, different cities, different benefits and healthcare and um, other things that I keep hearing Andrea Salinas say she wants to give more rights and more benefits that taxpayers are paying for to illegal immigrants when they come here. And I, I've a lot of issues on it recently. And I just think I it's wrong that so that many people are struggling here and are not getting free rent in New York City or in a, in a uh, hotel room or not getting $500 gift cards when they come to a state. Or I, I think that's wrong. They come here under an asylum, uh, under a, a makeshift of reason they're being here. Most of them are here for economic reasons. But they, what we should do is secure the border. If I was in Congress, I would try to get some legislation that would, one, do two things. Secure the border, first and foremost. We need to stop what's going on. 15 million people come to this country, or maybe it's 10 million or 18 million, but say it's 15 million. That's just wrong. That's undocumented people. And the majority are not the ones that come here. They're coming here just on their own, looking for new jobs and a new way of life. And a lot of them aren't just from Mexico or Venezuela or Argentina. They're from China. They're from other places, Middle East. It's all been seen on TV and documented. But I think what we need to do is make the guest worker visa program, the F1 guest worker visa program. I, I've got some employees that want to come up here from Mexico to come work for us. I helped them in that process. And it's painful. It's a, it takes a year to get through the pot. You almost have to get lawyers involved. You pay your 450. Some people are paying a thousand dollars or more to get their guest worker visa program. So they come here legally. What we need to do is change, like Selena said, is that since 1990, we haven't had real, real immigration reform. I like to be a leader and having to go through that process and know what some of the struggles are is to make sure that program is easier. Why don't you put 10, 15,000 people instead of IRS agents, 80,000 IRS agents, put 20,000 of them into working in and doing the background checks and pushing the, the applications through faster and make it a $200 application fee instead of a $700 or 450, depends on which worker visa and make it so it's turned faster. Then you're going to see people say, hey, you know something? I'll do this online. It only takes two, three months. We can speed it up. We need the people here in the farms. We need the folks working like, like we've all talked about earlier. So we make the guest worker visa program easier so they can come in here for two to four years, go back, reapply, or, or re up, up to their um, application. You will have real immigration reform. That's something I want to do. Secure the border and really address the biggest problem. is people are coming here illegally through the asylum process because the, the guest worker program is broken. People are taking, it's taking too long to get that process. I want to fix that. That would help solve what's going on the southern border, period. May I address HR2? HR2 included an e-verify program that would have required anybody to make sure that the people that they are hiring are actually there legally. So you would have made employers enforcers. And so all of the farms and restaurants in our district then would have had the obligation to make sure that everyone that they are hiring is there legally. Is that what you would have voted for? Uh, are you, uh, listen, I want you to- I, I'm telling you right now, that's already happening right now. You're required as an employer. I don't, you're not an employer. You've never run a business. You've never hired- Not a under E-Verify. You've never once had to put a signature on the front of a paycheck. You've never had to hire somebody to go through the checks. They do that. We do that. Somebody comes in here, I'll check to make sure they're a U.S. citizen and so forth, no matter which one of my businesses I run. You're wrong. We do that now. And people it don't mind doing that. Force, the immigration enforcement provisions over onto employers. Well, I, don't, I think that's not okay what, what you that? said on Univision is said, and some of the reasons you voted um, no on different bills, like even the uh, the most recent farm bill that you said no to that ticked off a lot of farmers in Yamhill and Polk County. You said it doesn't go far enough for um, immigration benefits for people who are coming here illegally, or migrant workers eating that is benefits. Flatly that's untrue. one reason I'm not voting. You're on Univision quoting that, and I'm going. That's just more benefits to people. That's the reason you said no to the farm bill. I'd I like to. to farmers are upset that I mean that you're making this harder for them. The farm bill was, but you say no to it recently was a big slap in the face of the farmers of Oregon here. I would like to move on. Um, 
And Mike, Sorry, this question is for you. Time. Mike, th this question is for you. Um, Trump has, um, so currently um, uh, House Speaker Johnson is working on a bill to ensure that government can continue beyond a shut or not shut down. Um, but as there's been recent stories about President Trump saying, don't, you know, urging Republicans to vote down any kind of continuing resolution if it doesn't include a provision that requires people to show documentation of citizenship in order to register to vote. Do you think that that provision is worth shutting government down for? No. Okay. So you no, would vote I, I think that what we're doing on a on a quarter to quarter basis and having our country and our budget, I don't run that as a business. I I don't I got a budget and we live with it. We look at our budgets every month and quarterly. If you're a little suffering one quarter, you don't go through and I, I'm not here to use uh political hostage taking to to get what you want. We need to have a budget that's set for the whole year. And you vote on it and get it done for the whole year. That's good for the, the American economy. It's good for the uh, everybody. Why are we doing this, playing politics with our budget? There's too many things dependent upon that. And if you were elected, how would you try to um, enhance unity in your own caucus? There have been oh. a number of times over the past couple of years where, um, you know, the vote for House Speaker has been so polarized and 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 very chaotic, um, where it leaves the public's business at risk. So what would you do? I guess, where would you stand in that spectrum of, of views? And how would you try to foster some kind of or more functionality? Well, the House committee set themselves up for problems down the road. When Kevin McCarthy went through and set up that just one member can create uh, a, a vacancy request, to me, it's just set yourself up for failure. You have one member of the 234 34 people who get upset with them for not getting a committee chair or something like that, and you've got some pet peeves. That's just problematic. I don't, I've never seen that happen before. So as a member of Congress, I was in the, in the, the very beginning of the committees, um, getting ready to set the rules in the committees. I would make it has to be at least five people. Then you don't have that problem. Uh, you might, but not as easily as one person stepping up. So I, I'm against that kind of turmoil. It's bad for the country. It's bad for if, that, if both parties had the same rules, it'd be bad for both parties. So I'm against that. But I, I'd like to just bring before our time runs out. I know I, I just want to bring a couple things to you. Um, and I'd like to get your I was hoping there'd be more editors. Is there anybody else still listening or just the four of us? It's just the four of us there. They will be watching it later. Um, okay. Just I'd just like to bring up one thing to, to the editorial board. And I know we're going to run out of time in a couple minutes. And but the Oregon um, Court of Appeals is hearing our case on the slander defamation case against Andrea Salinas for her lies in the last election. The Oregonian did no stories until the um, the Oregon Appeals Court had their hearing. But the, the judge ruled in Clackamas County Court that Andrea Salinas defamed me and said that literally- I don't think that was the ruling though, was uh, it? Uh, here's, here's I, I think the ruling was about, it, it, was rejecting the motion to- here. It says, I know, but I think you're incorrect. That, the I, think judge ruled in I, my I favor. looked it up on e-courts. The he, they ruled, ruled in your in favor, favor that it could that it could proceed. They didn't rule that Correct. she had defamed you. And here's what it says: Erickson Committee has made sufficient evidence to show that Salinas will likely be found guilty in court for knowledge for knowingly basically lying to voters with knowledge and reckless disregard for the truth. Now, you guys, that's a big thing that a judge ruled, and the Oregonian did nothing about that. Now, you may do something about her not reporting different things on her FEC reports from LaMada. But then but this big issue that is so important about someone's credibility and their character. And so, Mike, I will. So, so I, I should tell you, I'm you separate from the news. single story on that article. I'm uh, separate from the news wrong. side. I will. I can put you in touch with the news side. But I'm not, I don't oversee news. My understanding, because I just took a quick look at that a, a few days ago, was that this was a motion to dismiss or something along those lines. And the standard for that is what is the the a very basic amount of evidence. It's not actually declaring that that this was defamatory or anything. It was about just is there evidence well, that can be that can make that, the argument. Well, the and so what is being that. appealed to the appeals court is whether or not. It is the judge's decision on on that amount of evidence. Hell so, no, last thing in the judge's transcripts, it says the court concludes. Andrea Salinas, Andrea Salinas, this is their words. The court concludes the very bottom of the transcripts. Court concludes Andrea Salinas knowingly made statements that were false with reckless disregard for the truth. Now, that tells you everything. And the Oregonian did nothing about that. And then that's also the last thing I heard today. 
Andrea said that her earlier in her statements earlier that her father was a uh, a migrant worker, worked in the fields his whole life, this and that. And I just heard a minute ago he was a 32 year police officer. I, I, was he, it was your I think if you look at our actually, if you if you go back and watch our um, interview from two years ago, I'm talking you'll, right now. you'll you'll hear you. Um, Andrea, I'm talking about just talk right now in the statements, Andrea. So I just want clarification for my purpose. She said her at the beginning, she said that her father was a farm worker, a migrant worker from Mexico, worked in the fields most of his life, that she grew up in a family that was struggling. I never said that, most of his life, well, Mike. We can replay this, but it's the very beginning. We can replay it. And then you said, my father's been a police officer for 32 years. Age five where was, your, where was your father a police officer? Because I'm having a little truth issue here with what you say about things. And I'm just... I just want to get the truth here. Was your father really a police officer, corrections officer, a jail guard? Was was he a police officer for 32 years? In what city? Mike, I don't have to answer these questions. Because I don't think it's true. So I think... Oh, that's a Trump move, 30, Mike. 30, 30, 32 years, <laughs> police officer. When you <laughs> And the first time in all your voters' pamphlets, my father's been a, a farm worker, worked in the fields, and now he's a 30 year, 30, 32 year... Today you said 32 year police officer. I'd like to know the truth. What city did he work in? Because if he, if he worked as a police officer, you would know what city he worked in. Well, actually, so can you tell me what city he worked in? I I think that this is. This uh, is can we get that answer? Just she mentioned something that maybe not true. Uh, so so I will like Erickson show. Yes. Did you? What city did he work in? Helen, may I may I address? I, actually, if you would real... if you would answer, that would be great. I I would like to actually. Uh, go to some kind of closing statement, yeah. but yeah. I'm kind of concerned at how that will I'm go. I'm curious what, what police force you look. I can't find it in all of our research. So I am confident in the ad that we ran, which cited police charges describing my opponent's arrest. And this is actually going into. I I really don't want to go into relitigating. Right. What I is actually, one question. Okay. Yes, but I was going to say this is an ongoing. You know, this is ongoing litigation, and I can't really comment. But I will say that I have never been in trouble with the law. What city and, did your father work as a police officer? Because I don't think he did. If corrections officers are not police officers. Working in a jail as a guard is not a police officer. So you're making statements on TV that people need to check into. He did. I don't. Every research we did, he was never a police officer. Can you please tell me what city your father was a police officer? Mike, it is not up to me to give you a discount on your research costs. You go figure that out. Well, Andrea, is that say. something you would be willing to answer? Absolutely. What is it? He worked for the San Francisco Police Department for 32 years. Thank you. Um, we'll I, think, okay. I that, think... That's all I need to know, so it'll help me, whatever. So, okay. I think let's just do... Let's just do 30-second closing. <laughs> something really short. Um, uh, Andrea, if you wouldn't mind going first. Thank you. Um, thank you again to Mike. Thank you to the um, Oregonian editorial board. I have been really enjoying the work that I am doing here. I serve on the House Agriculture Committee, the Science, Space and Technology Committee, as well as the Executive Commission on China. Um, that gives me a great angle in terms of what China is doing in terms of some of the intellectual property as well as human rights issues. So a little bit more global perspective in terms of how Oregon um, is playing in in that global role and global space. House Ag, I've been working my tail off to make sure that our farmers get what they need. And like I said, in this House um, Farm Bill reauthorization, and I'm hoping that we can negotiate with the Senate and get something done. And like I just mentioned, I can share the letter with you that I sent with a bunch of my colleagues to my leadership to make sure that we do get something done. Um, I feel like I've been um, a leader in science, space, and technology working across the aisle with um, my chair, Frank Lucas from Oklahoma, pushing on a bunch of different me measures, whether it's um, quantum research or today around artificial intelligence and giving our community colleges and some of our different technical institutions um, some more resources to figure out how they are going to play in the um, AI space as well. So I'm really excited for what is possible and what's ahead of us and what or and how Oregonians can benefit from so many of the investments that have been made over the last couple of years. But we need somebody again, and this is what I said last time, who can hit the ground running. I passed a bill in one of the most unproductive Congresses in history, we only passed 27 bills. I was a freshman member. I am a freshman member in the minority. I worked across the aisle to get this bill passed. The president signed it on December 31st. I, or 
late December, I should say, but before January. I am really proud of that, right? Bringing millions of dollars back to the district. Our hard-earned tax dollars are coming back. I'm talking to mayors all across the region, you know, everybody from Sherwood to Sheridan, you know, Tiger to Wallaton Turner, the entire district trying to figure out kind of what our regional needs are and then what the needs of Oregonians are too at large. Um, I know how to work. I know how to work legislation. I know how to work with relationships. Um, I think I have the right character and the right sense of what Oregonians need. And I love the actual on the ground work, talking to people, understanding their issues, their problems, what the day to day lives are like, and then how to put that into policy solutions that will work for everyone. I want a chance at another um, two years in this job. And I thank you so very much. Thank you. And Mike, how about you? Can you give us a uh, one or one minute closing. That'd be great. Well, I believe in a member of Congress should always act with openness, honesty, transparency, and character. And that is the most important thing. If you represent the people of this district in DC, you need to be able to answer questions honestly and tell the truth. Andrea Salinas got elected by 2% by line to voters. And, and it has been called out here. I mean, she knew in her research that there was never any charges filed against me. Any, any simple research my closing stuff here, is the fact that she knew there was no charges. She just hinged on a little police report that was a mistake and used that to win the election. She smeared me with millions of dollars of TV the last month on an ad. Even the district attorney, Democrat district attorney, told her it wasn't true. You got to stop and pull those ads. She did it. She kept running them. That's what the lawsuit's all about. That's about character. She should have told pull the ad immediately. Back in her Salem debate, I asked her, are you going to pull the ad? Nope. So be it. The good thing about the Oregon law is that when we win this case, the Oregon law is real clear. Oregon Corrupt Practices Act don't allow a person running for office to lie about your opponent. And so far, we're ahead in this legal battle. And the judge ruled in our favor that she knowingly misled the voters. And the Oregon law is real clear. If we win in court here, she could be removed from office immediately, the judge's decision. I'm hoping that happens because what she did was just wrong. Two, the second thing about transparency and honesty that I'm going after is even like the um, the the polling or the tolling. In the last election, Channel 8, um, Pat Doris went through and did the research. I called her out that she was um, voted for tolling on TV. She came out and Twittered and told everybody, I would ever vote for, to vote for tolling. She did. Even uh, Julie Parrish, other state representatives, texted her and called her. You must have been asleep at that will. You must have missed the entire House floor debate, but you voted for tolling. It's on that record. She voted for tolling. Pat Norris said, yep, Salinas voted for tolling, yet she told everybody she wouldn't do it and did it. That's a lie. She and Mike, I just want to interrupt. Measure 110. Right. And Mike, recently. I just want to, right, hold on. I just want to let you know your video went off. I'm not sure why, but I just wanted to, you to be aware of that. Okay, I, I know why. You know what, that's fine. I appreciate okay. that. But I mean, the Measure 110, just for you two and Sammy, Measure 110 on Channel 2 a month ago. Salinas goes up and says, I would never vote for Measure 110. I never supported it. I just sent you both the Measure 110 website. She's on there as a proud supporter of Measure 110. There are photos on the website with her standing behind a banner with people support Measure 110. Her name's on there. I just sent it to you both. Um, she told Channel 2 News. And you can, I'll send you the link. I would never vote for Measure 110. It was a bad, but she voted for it, both herself and on, online. She said, I'm going to vote for it. Please join me and vote for Measure 110. She's on this stuff I just sent you. Um, Andrea Salinas, you told Channel 2 you did not vote for or support Measure 110 on TV a month ago. Can you please maybe just, add, I mean, did you not support Measure 110 now? We got, I got proof. I sent it to you guys. So, Mike. Um, I'm just going to ask you, did you, you said one thing to Channel 2. Right. We're I guess nine minutes over. I'm ready to go. Yeah, because you know you're, you're lying to voters. Mike, you so, Mike, I just want to know your closing really isn't I would love about to have a, a, you know, oh. I look forward to more of these debates. But honestly, Andrea, if you stop the lion, I wouldn't be saying these things on, on right now. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, I think we're good. Um, I appreciate the time. Uh, it was an interesting conversation, and I'll be in touch if we have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.